But now that we've seen a bunch of examples at work, I want to finish this video by just talking about Grice's official definition of an implicature. Because we've said in rough and ready terms what an implicature is, we've given the big picture of how implicature is supposed to work on his theory, and now we sort of under understand enough to understand the definition that he wants to give of an implicature. So as you might have kind of expected from the, uh, the last time that we talked about Grice, the definition of implicature is kind of complicated, and it in fact has five different clauses. So it starts by saying, well, by saying that P, you implicate Q just in case five things hold. One is that you're presumed to be following the cooperative principle. Remember, the idea that people are being cooperative, that's what makes the audience look for an implicature in the first place. They presume that you're following the cooperative principle. So that's the first part. The second part is that the implicature, Q, whatever you implicate, it's a good way to ensure that the sum total of what you said is in fact in line in the end with the cooperative principle. Supposing that what you really meant to say in addition was Q is a good way to explain how you, how you really are being cooperative in the end. So supposing you believe Q is a way to ensure you're following the Quarter Principle. So that's the second condition. There are a few more conditions now that we haven't explicitly talked about in the examples, but I think it will, you'll see why they might be necessary. So the third thing Grice says is that, well, if you want to implicate something, it must be that not only do you believe it, but you believe it's in the power of your audience to work out that that's what you intended. Because think about all of those examples. It's no accident that people said the things that they did. It wasn't just that they kind of thoughtlessly violated the maxims. Rather, they did it deliberately, because they assume it would it's not only the case that, they, that the audience is able to work it out, but the speaker actually presumes that the audience is able to work it out. And that's why they say that in the first place. So think back to the, to the handwriting example. When you say, the professor, has good hand, the professor has good handwriting. The reason why somebody says that, the reason why the speaker says that, is because they presume the audience will be able to do the reasoning that we're talking about. They presume that the audience will be able to recognize that they violated the maxim, and they presume that the audience will be able to find the right explanation, i.e. that they believe the professor is a bad professor. So it's got to be that when you implicate something, you think your audience is going to be able to work that out. So you think, you think your audience can work out that this is true. The fourth condition Grice says is that when you implicate Q, you've done nothing to suggest to your audience that you don't want them to conclude that Q. You've done nothing that would make your saying Q or meaning Q implausible. Why is that important? Well, if you think back to the examples we started with, and particularly about the cancelability test, we saw that when you explicitly deny that you're, that you're saying something, that tends to make the implicature go away explicitly saying, I don't want you to infer that I mean that I mean Q, is a very good way to ensure that you don't implicate Q. And so this is part of what Grice wants to ensure by adding this fourth condition. You've done nothing to prevent the audience from concluding that Q.
And the last, the very last condition is again a kind of simple one. What Grice says in this fifth condition is that when you implicate something, you intend for your audience to believe it. Now, I think cast your mind back to when we talked about Grice and communication before and meaning stuff. Remember, part of what what, what meaning something is, is wanting for your audience to believe it. So think, if you think about implicatures, it's not just an accident. It's not, it's not just that somebody is able to work out that you believe this when you implicate something. It's that you're trying to communicate that to them. You're trying to communicate that to them without literally coming out and saying it. But it really is a form of communication. And to make sure that our, it, it counts as a kind of communication on our definition, we explicitly write in that you intend for your audience to believe whatever's implicated. That you intend the audience to believe Q, the thing you're implicating. Okay, so as I said, unsurprisingly, it's kind of a complicated definition. But if we think about it, there's a reason for all the different conditions. So first of all, we said it's presumed that you're following the cooperative principle. Why is that in the definition? It's in the definition because that's what's supposed to get everything off the ground in the first place. It's only because the speaker is being presumed to follow the cooperative principle, that's really what's going to generate the implicature. Secondly, it's supposing that you believe whatever you're trying to implicate is a good way to ensure that you're really following the cooperative principle after all. In these cases, what tends to happen is you say something that looks like it violates the cooperative principle, but if we suppose you're implicating this further thing, then there's no longer a violation. We can explain away why it appears that there's a violation. So that's our second condition. So these two together are what underlie the audience's reasoning. So these are kind of on the audience side. And then we have a bunch of things that have to happen on the speaker side as well. And the reason why we have these things on the speaker side is because it's not just that this is like an educated guess on the part of the audience. We want to say that when you implicate something, you're genuinely communicating it. It's not just something the audience is able to figure out, it's something you wanted them to figure out. And so there are a few, what we might say, speaker side conditions. So first of all, if, you're, if you implicate something, it must be that you think your audience can work it out. You wouldn't have said it if you thought that they wouldn't be able to figure out the extra thing that you meant. It also must be that you haven't done anything to make your audience overlook that way of explaining it. If I've denied something earlier on, then it's very hard for me to implicate it. If I've denied Q earlier on in the conversation, well then it won't be open to the audience to try and explain my, my utterance by appealing to the fact that I believe Q, because I've already, I've already told the audience that I don't do that. So the four conditions, you've done nothing to prevent the audience from concluding Q. That includes things like denying it earlier in the conversation. And the last thing is, well, you simply intend the audience to believe Q. Remember, we want this to be an instance of communication. Generating communication, you intend for your audience to believe what you're telling them. So we have this fifth condition. So what we did in this video was that we looked at a number of specific examples, and we saw how exactly could breaking maxims, violating maxims, how could that lead to implicatures. And the general idea is that, well, when a, an audience sees a speaker violating a maxim, they try to explain it away, and the best explanation they come up with will tend to be what's implicated. But strictly speaking, so that's what gives us these first two conditions in the definition that we considered at the end. And then we wanted to say that when you implicate something, you're genuinely communicating something, if that's the case, it looks like we want some further conditions on the speaker side, namely that they think the audience can work out what they're trying to tell them, they haven't done anything which will prevent the audience from working out what they've told them, and that they intend the, for the audience to believe what they're saying. So in this video, we've kind of seen how the, how the account is supposed to work in particular examples, and we've put together all the conditions that Grice thinks are needed to explain when people implicate things in conversation.